So before break, you had loaded in the um, West example case. You loaded the PowerFlow case. Then you loaded the transient stability case. What we're going to do now in this section is show you how you can get access to all the data that you loaded in. So with the case open, PowerWorld provides you a number of ways to look at data, but a key way this is done is using the Model Explorer, which is under the Case Information tab on the top. So we were at File before. If you go to Case Information, click Model Explorer, it will open up a form that looks like this, where on the left side you've got access to essentially all the records that PowerWorld has stored associated with this case. And I'll scroll up to the top here on the Model Explorer. This is the same Model Explorer that if you've been using PowerWorld for PowerFlow that you have seen all along. Like under network here, it shows the buses, branches, generators. This is all PowerFlow information. Okay, and you can also get access to that by case information network or aggregation or solution details. Those all go to the Model Explorer. So we're not going to look at the power flow data because that's covered elsewhere. Uh, aggregation, that's power flow data as well, areas, islands, multi-section lines, owners, things like that. What I want you to do is scroll down on the Model Explorer and if you get towards the bottom, you will see a tab here that is transient stability. Click on transient stability and it opens up that tab and it shows you uh, transient stability information. We had talked about generator machine models, generator exciter models, generator governors models. We're going to get to all that. But first, on the summary one, click on the arrow next to summary and open up the summary, and that provides you a summary of what you've got in the case. So if you click on summary, it shows generator model use, load model use, model support status. The one we want to go to first is models and use. So if you click models and use, you will get a listing like I've shown here called the transient stability model summary form. This shows you a listing of all the different model types you have in that case. And it's a standard PowerWorld case information display. So if you want to sort by, let's say, model class, you just right click it and it'll sort alphabetically forward and backward, object type forward and backward, active, unactive, models. So I, I click so I, I sort. It shows me a list of all the different types of models that we have in this case. Okay, so that's showing you the available model types, a list of the specific models. Um, if you on this want to see details, let's say about Gen ROU, if you right click on that and do show dialog, this shows you a dialog of all the Gen ROU models listed in that case. Gen ROU was the one that we put in by default. Okay, on the seven bus case, we just put in the default Gen ROU. What this shows you is the Gen ROU, and it shows you every parameter for every Gen ROU in the case in a case info display. Um, if you're not familiar with PowerWorld case information displays, uh, it's hard to explain very quickly, but the gist is you can get access to a lot of this data. You can send it out to Excel, save it in aux files, quick plot it, all sorts of different things. And all this data is enterable as well. Okay, so we show you all the data in the case. What I use this display for a lot is let's say I'm running a model and I want to know is that parameter kind of an outlier or not? Like say I uh, click on the, um, the inertia H field, I'm going to click on that to sort it high to low or low to high, and I see by sorting this low to high, I see that there's one generator that has an H of 36, 
and then kind of they fall off like this. Is that data valid or not? Well, it gives you a feel for the range on the data in that display. And then if I, I I'm just moving over the side here, uh, bus number, what is it, 14,913, maybe it really has an H of 36. I don't know. You know, but this gives you access to that, all that data. I, I use it all the time to get a feel for are my constants correct or not. So it, it's very helpful in that regard. Okay, and you can, you can use this dialog to see all the, all the different case values here. Another one that is quite useful is if you go back to the summary one here, generator model use, this gives you a summary of each generator in the case and which models are being used for that generator. So if we click on that, generator model use, this now lists the generators, in this case it's numerically by their bus number, and then it shows you the you know, the number, name, ID, status, the megawatt, the base, what machine model is being used, what exciter model is being used, what governor model is being used, what stabilizer model is being used. Okay, so the idea is to make it very easily accessible to get access to all this different data. Kind of moving on here, we're on slide 15, now we're going on to 16. If we look at the um, left side, kind of the model explorer listing there, we're going to look at the load models in the case. So if you click on load characteristics, it shows you, so I, I clicked over here under transit stability. We went off a summary. Now we're looking at the load characteristics. Um, this shows all the different load models defined in the case. And let me just slide over here. So it gives you a feel for all the different load models in the case. Loads are a little tricky because with generators, there's a specific generator out there and you have specific parameters on that generator. So generator models are all unique. What's often done with load models is you can define load model parameters at a hierarchy of different locations. You can define one single load model for the entire case. You can define a load model for a particular area. You can define a load model for a particular bus or you can define a load model for a particular load and there's a couple of different ways to do it. So that's all given here on this different listing here of load characteristics. You can see all the loads. You can see in this, this was an older model, so it's got one motor W model. If we wanted to see what is that motor W model, if we uh, left click on that, that shows us the motor W model and it shows us the parameters associated with the motor W model. If I right click on that, I can see a dialog that shows details on that motor W model and get access to all them and I can change them from here if I want as well. Did all of this data come from what example do you like or did Yes. This all came this all this dynamic data was loaded by that DYD file. Yeah, so there's no default data in here. It's just what was ever in that file. The EPC file didn't have anything to contribute to this. The only con contribution from the EPC file was it gave us the bus numbers and the bus names and things like that. So, I mean, the, the EPC set up the power flow model and it said, hey, at this bus, there's 30 megawatts and 15 megavars, but how that should be modeled as a load came out of the DYD. Okay. Same thing with the generator. It said, you know, 100 megawatts, 50 megawatts on that generator, but all the dynamics data came from the DYD. Okay, in the, in the slide set here, there's a number of different 
slides on the load, including a load distribution equivalent model. I think the easiest thing to do is to have Jamie cover that when Jamie gets here. Yeah, on the third day, we're going to go over your, some of your specific cases that actually have this data in it, and it's probably going to make more sense in that context. Yeah, because the example, the West example case doesn't have the load model that's talked about in the slides in it. The slides talk about the newer load model that's being used in WCC. So we will get to that on Thursday. So we're going to skip ahead to slide 30, and that'll show on the generator model. So go ahead and go, if you're following along in your slides, up to slide 30. And I'm going to go back to this one right here, generator model use under the summary. This lists all the generators and what models are used for that generator. There's also one on loads, load model in use, which you can click on if you want. But then we'll get to that in more detail on Thursday. We'll get back to the generators in just a second. There is, to finish up the summary, there is one model support status, which is kind of an older display, which I have seldom clicked on. But we'll click on it right now just so you can see what's there. This lists all the different models that Power World knows about, and then it says who supports that model. Uh, what you will find if you do transient stability studies for different utilities with different packages is PSLF supports some models, PTI supports some models, and the models are not the same. Sometimes there's subtle differences, sometimes there's less subtle differences. So what Power World has done is we have implemented essentially all the models supported by GE, PSLF, essentially all the models supported by PTI, PSSE. Not all of them, because there are some that are very specific, but you'll see a listing here. And um, Power World right now has quite a few yeses in our column. If you click on that Power World column, it used to be there were quite a few no's in here as we were developing this out. So this is a display that we sort of started out internally for our use so we'd know what's supported and what's not supported. Now essentially everything that we know about is supported. Uh, one example that we haven't supported is the PSSC Shaft 25 model. Uh, we haven't supported the HYST1 model from PSLF because we don't have a good black diagram on it. But most everything is supported here. So the audience might look at either the BPA IPF. Yeah. So the story behind that is for the Chinese uh, who are using a variation of the Bonneville IPF program. Is that, that's why no, that's, that's right. Uh, Power World was working with a, a, a utility in China and when we go over there, BPA is like king in China. <laughs> we're like, well, we're working with BPA, and they don't use the BPA uh, IPF, and they're like, oh, we need to have the BPA IPF. So <laughs> it's like we have a lot of models in here that were set up for these guys. If you click on the yes here, all these BPA underscore FL or FQ or FA, we sort of support all those, but we're not doing, I mean, hopefully China's moving on to, <laughs> it's like, I mean, these, these are sort of older versions of some of the other models is what they are. So you will, it, I, I can't imagine you guys ever using those models, but they are in there. They don't get the highest priority when we're debugging stuff that, yeah, the Monica software, the support for that ended right around 2001, I think it was. And so there, there was no enhancement to the Bonneville maintained software for the past 15 years. And there should be three options, yes, no, and sort of. <laughs> <laughs> We, like, like, I, like I said, there, there's been a lot of validation between Power World and PSLF and, and a bunch between Power World and PSSC. Between Power World and that, let's put it on the low side. 
So we coded them up, but are they validated? Uh, no, because we don't have that code to validate again. So models in use again. Those CYD files, the EPA dot uh, those what the seeds. Well, I mean, what has an approved list of CYD files that you can forward into a territory? It's EPA. That's a DYD file. That's oh, I don't even data. think that uh, Bonneville, the old IPF. Are you talking about the old IPF? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I don't even think it reads the DYD file. It's okay. its own Okay, so format. Chase wouldn't have anything like that in it. No, anyway. you're never going to encounter this. All right. Yeah. So that was just. Okay. Yeah. Well, if you're in China, you <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we just sold a copy of this to Chinese EPRI, so we're trying to figure out what they want to do with it, and we don't know. Okay. So we hope we hope they want to use it in a, <laughs> a positive sort of way. <laughs> um, let's see. We we covered right clicking on this. And seeing the details, the, the parameters there. What else do we do here? If if you go and you go down like the list of exciters there, so I just went off of that summary page and I went down here. Let's say I want to see all the exciters I have in the case. I can click on generator exciters. There's 2711 exciters modeled in the case. Um, this provides a summary of all the different exciters. You might say, how come you can't show every exciter and its parameters in one big list display? And the reason why is every one of these models has different parameters associated with it. So I can't create a single display showing all the exciter parameters because the models are different. If you go down here, I don't know if you guys have any in here, but I, if you look at IEEE T1, which is a relatively simple one, if I click on IEEE T1, I see all the IEEE T1s, and then if you scroll over, you can see all the parameters associated with the IEEE T1, and there's not a lot with an IEEE T1, but you're, you're seeing all the parameters associated with that one. Down here, we let you filter this by the packages that support it. So you guys might say, all right, I don't care about PSSE models because I don't use PSSE. So if you click the PSSE or PTI, if you uncheck that, it changes the list to just show the models that are supported by a GE or PowerWorld only. And Power World only, there's not many models because we didn't want to further confuse the situation. Okay, on any one of these entries here, I think we're still on IEEE T1. If you right click on that entry and do show dialog, you see the generator dialog associated with that IEEE T1 model. This is the same generator dialog that we started with when we entered in the Gen ROU models. So all I did was I took that listing there and I right clicked on it, show dialog, and I go to the generator dialog. Uh, you can look at the power flow characteristics, you know, fall, whatever is in the model for that generator, you can see it there. But this way you can go from the exciter if you want to say, hey, that IEEE T1 exciter, what's the machine model associated with it? You just click over here, you see the machine model. What's the governor? What's the stabilizer? What's the other model? The idea is to make it easy for you to get access to the data that you want to see. And the Power World Convention is if they're in blue, they're enterable, so you can directly enter them there. If the entry is grayed out, for example, going back to the IEEE 1, that's grayed out because this model uh, generator is not in service. So it, it's in the case, it's just not in service. Right here, there's a device status. The device status is saying, is that exciter actually active? 
a generator can be out of service and still have an active exciter, that exciter is not going to be included in the model because the generator is not included. Okay, but this way you can customize if you want to turn off an exciter. A lot of times we do this where we'll turn off a stabilizer model. You can toggle it on or off. So if I were doing a run and I thought, hey, that, let me, let me do the one above it. If I thought that exciter is not good, I'm going to turn it off. I can just double click on that active and disable that exciter. Okay, then if I right click on the model, do show dialog, on that exciter, there's a field here that says, is it active or not? And in this case, it's not checked. So the value of this, from my own experience, is the validation when you run validation, and there's the autocorrect that Power Simulator has, and it corrects almost everything, but you might have two little things it's not correcting, and it's going to refuse to run. And so the way to disable that is then you can easily just toggle, uh, deactivate, and then and then you're good to go. And those models are maybe little things down south. If you're um, thinking, golly, I don't remember what an IEEE T1 model looks like. We have the block diagrams easily accessible. If you click the Show Block Diagram button, you should get a block diagram on an IEEE T1. Caroline, you drew all these, didn't you? I did some of them when I was being punished. <laughs> so when, when Caroline was being punished, she had to draw the IEEE T1 block diagram. So I just clicked on that show block diagram, and this is just a PDF file that has that block diagram on it, so you can zoom in. and, and th This is a big file. This is page 94 of 341 pages, so you can save the whole thing as a PDF. I mean, you can use whatever you want to make it bigger or smaller. But uh, just where, where were you clicking on this? On, on the generator information dialog, Show block diagram. You guys seeing the block diagram? Mm -hmm. Just curious. Do you guys have all these block diagrams in MATLAB or something like that so you can understand? You can test and run and understand block diagram better? Something like that? Is there in Word? <laughs> no, I mean, the, the, the coding them up is actually, no, we haven't coded them up in MATLAB or Simulink or anything like that. We coded them up in Power World. And then, believe me, every one of these models has been uh, compared. I mean, it, it, it's in in taking any two software packages and comparing them. How do you know the software package has implemented the block diagram correctly? And and this is something that I'll talk to people like people that use PS, uh, PSSE. And I'll say, well, how do you know it, it's working correctly? And they're like, well, we've used it for years. It's like, well, yeah, but so what? <laughs> I mean, if there's a bug in there, you don't know. Because you can only really ascertain that there, I mean, honestly, if you're, if you're an engineer and you're saying, okay, I got response in the IEEE 21 exciter, how do I know that it's working correct? I mean, what do you do? I mean, you can code it up in MATLAB or something, but then you'd have to code up the generator model that's associated with it. And if you start coding up a Gen TPF model, you know, did you code that correctly in MATLAB or not, or Gen TPJ? I mean, they're not trivial models to code up. So what we have done, and this is primarily University of Illinois for the project funded by BPA, is we compared a lot of PSSC, or I mean PSLF and Power World runs, and Terry's the project manager here, we would create two bus equivalents and we automated this process so we could do it in batch. We ran all your generators and compared the two bus behavior for d various fault scenarios and looked at what did PSLF do and what did Power World do and where there were discrepancies, we f went down and figured out what the discrepancies were. Have you validated against any TMU data or anything that was real time data? Well, funny you should ask that because we have a proposal into BPA. <laughs> <laughs> that is an ongoing effort in the industry to validate it. And the easier one to do is at the generator level because there you've got the generator isolated and there has been a lot of work done on that. 
the trickier one is you guys have these load models in there, and it's like, how do you know what your load is? Well, the load's constantly changing, you know, because temperature changes, time of day changes. I mean, it's, it's an ongoing effort for the industry. But the effort to compare the packages, prior to the start of the project we were doing with you guys, we we started out, they did not match. When we ran the different packages, PowerTech, PSSC, PSLF, PowerWorld, they, they did not match. And now PowerWorld and PSLF match pretty closely. PowerTech's a little trickier because they don't seem to have the auto correction features that PowerWorld and, and PSLF have. So we can say pretty confidently PowerWorld and PSLF match really well. And I, I would, I, that's all I can really say. You know, but I would say to someone who says, well, I've been doing PSSE for years and, it, and it's good results. And I'm not saying they're not good results, but how do you know there's not issues lying out there that, you know. Do you learn anything from that comparison process that by something that done 20 years ago needs to be just throw away instead of just keeping it? Like, did you learn anything from this process? Like, you know, some of the model maybe like I keep saying or it could be 20 years old. And should they be thrown away? Well, the question is, did we learn anything from the process? On that question, yes, we learned a ton from the process. <laughs> we learned that details model matter, and you have to, you know, pay attention when you're coding these things in, and it's a good process to go through. We did not look and say, should this generator be modeled with an IEEE T1, which is a model from 1968. That was not part of the process. We just said. For whatever reason, this generator, whatever it is, is modeled with an IEEE T1. That's WECC's determination of what model you guys want to use. We just want to make sure that, yes, it matched and that they do match. But it got into all sorts of different details. I mean, it, it, it's, it's the quirks that are the ones that drive you nuts. Like this, this here, these parameters model a saturation curve on an exciter. And you might say, well, who cares? Um, People will, will, a saturation curve is supposed to be increasing. Okay. It, it's modeled a little bit differently in PSSC than in PSLF, and PowerWorld support, supports both types. But the difference in the model itself is not that important. But let's say I enter in and say, you know what, I want to model this as flat, as a minority of people do. And I say, I'm going to put this as, 3.77, these are just two points on a curve, and I'm going to put them both at 0 0.22. And I, I save that. Oops, shouldn't have done that. And that's the block diagram. Oh, that's the black diagram one. Caroline just told me about that one. So I save this, and so what what you have, what, what the data is, is sort of saying is I've, I've got a monotonically increasing curve like that. And you give two data points like that, and this is a quadratic that if you continued it below zero, it would go up like that. How do you want me to treat it if the points you give me are both equal? What should I do? What PSSC does is different than what PSLF does. One of them will treat it as constant, and one of them will treat it as zero. And actually, as I'm thinking about it, it might not even be that simple. But one of them treats it as zero. Because the model cannot fit to those two points. So you've given bad data, but people are using it. And of course, there's very few places where this occurs. But when you're doing the validation like we did, you spend all your time focusing on the outliers. Because that's where the errors pop up. So we have worked through that, but the, it's not even clear which way you want. It's almost like when, when we had the hanging chads on the 2000 election and people are trying to figure out voter intent. And we sit there and say, what is the modeler intent? <laughs> like, what do they really want? And sometimes we don't know. There are some special flags in here that you can get access to. Um, if we go generator governors, let's just click over here on generator governors because governors have a special flag associated with them. 
So if you click on generator governors, and then I'm going to scroll over a few columns here. One of the key flags associated with gener generator governors is whether the governor can actually respond to a change in frequency. A lot of governors are set so that they do not move up if the frequency is too low. If the frequency is low, you want your governor to push more power out of the machine, usually. But there's a lot of models where they don't do that. They, they do not increase their power output. That flag is very important, how it's set. And you were asking us about um, validating PMU results. On, on this Illinois project with WSU funded through BPA from Terry, we took your EMS case and we were looking at the response of a frequency disturbance that occurred in, I think it was January of 2014. Yeah, January 29th. And we were looking at all the PMU outputs and we were matching it with Power World and we found that if we use the, see, the EMS model doesn't have dynamic state in it. So we had to import dynamic state into the EMS model and we imported dynamics data using, I think, a summer case. And the summer case had these flags set for summer. And we weren't, giving, we weren't getting a good match, or we weren't getting a really good match. We were getting an OK match. When we loaded in the governor response limits for winter, which we got out of a winter case, which obviously it was in a winter event, the response was much better. So these flags. You know, and these usually they're set for large units. Like if I sort this by MVA base, so I get the big units, the Palo Verde units are set for down only. The Diablo units are set. I mean, this is an older case, but Diablo, San Onofre, Intermountain, you know, these are big units, most of which are set for down only. So the big units aren't responding for a, a it was, this was a low frequency issue. So those details do matter. So that, that flag is not in the DYD file. It's, it's in the power flow and it's called the base load flag. And so all new uh, wet cases have a base load flag of two in the EPC format, which means that uh, it's totally blocked. It's not, it can't respond to either uh, high or low frequency. Not really. Why is that? It was the edict from the MVWG. Well, what do they do? The, uh, the, the Palo Verde units will not respond to frequency change at all, whether it's high or low. But some must respond, right? Oh, yeah. But uh, anything that's oh. down only... They're now set to... Yeah, we support two different values on that. And, and if you right... Yeah, if you right-click on this, you get down only fixed or normal. So I guess now the down onlys are all fixed, so it would show up as that. The next one we're going to get into the small system studies, and and you'll be doing transient stabilities and plots and all sorts of fun stuff. So you're uh, saying they don't respond to an over frequency event at all, even? Correct. Okay. I'm saying that's how the base load flag is set. That's what came from MVWG. Okay. How do you net a generator? Can you just set the yeah, Power World nets the generators that are set as inactive. So if I wanted to like quickly disable this generator, I could go and I could, on its machine model, I could just set it as not active. If I set it as not active, if the machine model is not active, none of the other models are active because it doesn't make sense to have an exciter without a machine. So then this will be treated as negative generation, I mean negative load, and we've got a flag as to how you treat negative load, what the voltage dependence is on it, which we cover when we get to the options. If, if you disable the exciter, you will disable the stabilizer as well. I mean, the stabilizer doesn't have anything to do because it plays an input into the exciter that machine model will still be there. So when you disable the exciter, the field voltage is assumed fixed. Okay. So 
Yeah, a lot, like you can take out the governor and it's okay. It just doesn't respond at all. So that would be, I mean, it's, it's similar to the up fix, but not exactly the same. But yeah, then, I mean, you can take out a whole class if you want. Like if I wanted to take out all the gen ROUs, I just go to that display and I just toggle and toggle them all inactive. Dr. Lee, is there an easy way to find a disabled model? Um, yeah, sure. If, if you wanted to see generators in use, let's see, I don't think we showed them all. The, the stuff on their machine, oh, machine models, that would they'll, show it. They'll go great out, though. It'll show in there. Yeah, you, you would go to the machine models one and then sort on the status. So if, if I wanted to know, in this case, I've got 3,100 machine models in here. How many of them are inactive? I just sort it on the device status field, and that shows me all the machine models that are not active. The, u the user is going to be making it inactive. It's not going to come that way. Yeah. Is it sorting on the exciters on the inactive field? You can see the exciters that don't have models in here. But yeah, you can see by machine models, exciters, governors, things like that which ones are active or inactive. What does it do if you make something inactive in Power World and then export the D as a DOID file? W would it comment out the inactive things in the DOID file that it exports out? I assume it tries to do the netting section that's in the oh, okay. DOID. Yeah, we, I think we put it in the netting section mm -hmm. on you there. Can, you can export out things that you deactivate. You can export that into the DOID. It'll be it should be. It would be netted in the DYD file. One one thing, I mean, Power World, you know, obviously if you save this in a Power World PWB and load it back in, everything's fine. We also allow multiple models for a machine. Like you can you can go, you know, how much you want to do this. If you're like looking at this machine here and saying, okay, uh, for this generator, let me test out uh, EX, ESAC6A, and then you want to insert another one, you can put in a 5A. Only one of them can be active at a time, but we support multiple models as well. But only the active one's going to be exported. Both will be saved in the PWB, but only because their, their format doesn't support that.